Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this year's The Hate of Delancey Lecture. Who was The Hate of Delancey? He was an extraordinary man who lived a very long life and did a large number of diverse things. He was a Dutchman, but he ended up living in the Channel Islands, and he managed to be, I'm not sure whether it was in this order, a doctor, a surgeon, a dentist, an art expert, and a barrister. I suppose if you live to be 95, you have time enough to do all these things in succession. And he was a wealthy man, and he created a foundation to support medicine and law, the study of and interest in medicine and law. And some years ago, the Head of the Lancy Foundation gave the University of Cambridge a fund called the Head of the Lancy Fund, surprise, surprise, the main object of which is to pay for periodic lectures on medico-legal themes. This year, I'm delighted to welcome our colleague, Jeremy Horder, an eminent criminal law academic who after years in the University of Oxford, then migrated to the Law Commission, where he's been Law Commissioner with responsibility for criminal law matters. And when his time as a Law Commissioner ends, at the end of the summer, is going to a chair at King's College London. One of the projects which the Law Commission's been doing and with which uh, Jeremy has been involved is a project on the reform of expert evidence and part of the concerns about expert evidence and the need to reform the legal rules has been fueled by for example, the number of the shaken babies and alleged cop death cases, the Clark case, the Cannings case and certain other cases. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Jeremy who is going to talk for about 40 minutes and is brave enough to say that he will engage in discussion with you and attempt to answer your questions afterwards. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, and welcome to you all. Um, perhaps I should just say a brief word about the Law Commission, because although the organisation will be very familiar to law students amongst the audience here, it may not be to medical students um, and uh, professors of medicine who may also be in the audience here. The Law Commission, although funded by the Ministry of Justice, has been an independent organisation since 1965, and it advises government on desirable reforms of the law um, across the whole of the law of England and Wales, not just in the criminal law. And the way it proceeds is to conduct consultation exercises uh, on the basis of provisional proposals and questions about reform of the law, which it then circulates to interested parties, individuals and bodies, and of course now, days through the the web and so on. And um, it then, on the basis of that consultation, makes recommendations for changes in the law. And contrary to a very um, widespread urban myth, in fact its reports don't sit gathering dust on the shelves by and large. Uh, its success rate in getting reports implemented by government um, across the whole of the um, field of law is about 70 to 75 percent, and the criminal law considerably higher than that, in fact. Um, so, in those terms, um, the Law Commission has, over a period of years, been quite an influential body on law reform. Now, in this particular area, expert evidence in criminal proceedings, we published um, some time ago now um, a consultation paper called The Admissibility of Expert Evidence in Criminal Proceedings in England and Wales. And um, having consulted on that and then had uh, some 80 replies, not just from individuals, but from large organisations representing thousands of people, we are now in the process of um, completing our deliberations on what to recommend by way of change to the law and drafting a bill to reflect those recommendations, um, something which, in the normal course of events, the Law Commission will do. It will employ Parliamentary Council to draft a bill that, if need be, could go straight to Parliament um, for enactment, although that would not normally be the process. But nonetheless, the stage we're at is that we have done our consultation, we've received our consultation responses, 
we are now coming towards the end of our deliberation process. And what I want to do, in part at least, is to give you some idea about what Constantine's have said and where that has influenced in the way that we are going. But in a way, that's rather a, um, a, a subject of most interest, I suspect, to uh, lawyers, experts in evidence and criminal procedure. But what I want to do, uh, at least at the start of this lecture, is to try to, to broaden the focus out and to try to explain why it is that uh, this project came before us and was our, when we were asked to look at it. How did that come about? Well, I'm going to start in what might seem like a rather peculiar place, which is Norwich. And um, for those of you who haven't heard that um, there have been accusations of data manipulation at the University of East Anglia Climatic Research Unit, for those of you who haven't heard that there have been such accusations, well, welcome to planet Earth, because in fact, this, these accusations have been uh, much written about in the newspapers, as you probably know, and the subject of inquiries, um, and people being summoned before Parliament, and so on and so forth. And a body of the most eminent um, scientists imaginable has, um, well, not perhaps quite that eminent, but nonetheless very eminent indeed, has now completed its, its uh, investigation into the activities of the department. What did they find? There was no intention to deceive, um, it says up there, and which must have come as a relief uh, to all those concerned. But more significantly, uh, for the present purposes of the lecture this evening, um, the report was not uncritical. And one of the things that it said is, we cannot help remarking that it's very surprising that research in an area that depends so heavily on statistical methods has not been carried out in close collaboration with professional statisticians, it said. Um, now, um, how, if that had been done, would that have helped the scientists at uh, UEA escape the controversy that they found themselves in? Well, um, here are some of the issues that the committee found were problematic in relation to that particular um, uh, set of results. First of all, there's the problem of what statisticians sometimes call messy data. And by messy data, I don't mean as the, the, in the way that lawyers would understand that, that is papers all over, spread out all over the room everywhere. Uh, no, um, it's data compiled on different bases, put together from different kinds of experiment which don't necessarily have all, we don't have necessarily have the same degree of rigor, uh, but come up as uh, or are translated into a purely numerical count or something of that kind. So what have we got? Well, this eminent committee found that um, the UEA scientists had used measurements from individual weather stations. Well, that, that, that's fine. I mean, that, that you, that's what you'd expect of any climate change unit. However. Um, they haven't pointed out, or perhaps not as strongly as they should have done, that some countries have got lots of these stations, and therefore the accuracy of your um, measurements is likely to be correspondingly higher, but others have very few, and large areas of the Earth have got none at all. Um, so you can't actually say anything very much, um, or draw any inferences about climate change from those areas. Um, at least um, this is the implication that I'm drawing from what they found. Um, so the data were patchy in a way that perhaps ought at least to have been pointed out by um, the scientists investigating climate change. And um, even as far as they did take pains to point these things out, and in fairness to the UEA, UEA scientists, they mostly did actually indicate where there were likely to be weaknesses in their data. Um, other people, uh, and this of course is an inherent risk, isn't it, with any um, scientific proposition or, um, or suddenly popularised scientific theory, um, there can be oversimplification by other bodies who come into possession of the um, information. And of course, other bodies who have attempted to oversimplify scientific information include lawyers. They have a great fondness for oversimplifying scientific information for their own purposes. And um, one of these bodies was this infamous, or famous, depending on which way you look at these things, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which, amongst its other sins, had overlooked a discrepancy between direct and proxy measurement of climate change. Direct evidence being, obviously, the measurements from individual weather stations and so on, proxy measurement, tree root data, and so on. And um, now, this was quite interesting to me, I think, because what, what it demonstrates, of course, is that um, you can be a great expert on climate change. Um, but your grasp of statistics can be a bit hasty. Um, 
even though, of course, uh, at least in some parts of your investigations, you may rely on some statistical evidence. And for all experts, of course, other than in um, rather narrow disciplines, it will inevitably be the case that you do rely, at least to some extent, on assumptions about what um, other people are saying in their areas of expertise. I work in the criminal law. I recommend changes to the criminal law. I assume in all of that, of course, that a change in the criminal law may have some effect on, of a deterrent kind, preventing people from committing offences they might otherwise have gone on to commit or to commit in greater numbers and so on. So I'm making assumptions about human nature um, about which I know no more than the average person. I'm not an expert on that, particularly. I'm an expert on the criminal law. But I may make assumptions um, on which my work, at least in part, relies. I hope not wrongly. Uh, but that's just an illustration of how we can all, uh, however expert we may be, uh, be forced to rely uh, explicitly or implicitly on data that relates, or expertise that relates, to another field um, of expertise. Uh, it might have been a right, perhaps, for... Uh, Baron for Hayden de Lacey, who has, seems to have had this extraordinary facility across such a wide range. Um, I think um, John Abit has mentioned that he spoke about five languages, although um, being a Dutchman, perhaps that's um, perfectly normal, but nonetheless, uh, he had this extraordinary facility. And perhaps for him, this would not have been a problem. But for most of us in this world in which we increasingly specialise, it is a problem. Now, um, anticipating that uh, a problem of this, of this sort would loom large, um, I commissioned as part of our um, consultation paper, uh, a, very brief, a very brief paper from Professor David Hand, who's the head of the Royal Statistical Society and professor at Imperial College. And um, he very um, helpfully came up with some guides as to what one should do when one has to rely on statistics in particular, um, and how one should present one's results where that kind of reliance is involved. And as you can see here, as he rightly says, statistics are commonly used to match data to theories. That was certainly true in the UEA case. Um, and so the possible sources of error must be clear. False positive rates. What percentage? What proportion? Um, theories must not predict too wide a range of possible outcomes. Um, perhaps a problem with astrology, for example. Um, uh, almost infinitely variable in the range of possible outcomes. Although not an expert discipline for other reasons, but nonetheless. Um, any missing or imperfect data must be accounted for. Professor Hand was, was of the view that even Newton, for example, used to present rather, rather suspiciously perfect data with apparently no false negatives or false positives. Um, and um, in his view, there's been, in Newton's work, a certain element of illegitimate clearing up of um, what otherwise might be regarded as messy data. But nonetheless, it doesn't invalidate the theory, of course. But it just, um, one should have reason to be suspicious, in Professor Hand's view, no doubt rightly, where data appear to be absolutely perfect and there are no false positives, false negatives, and so on. And, um, and so those imperfect or missing data must be accounted for. And we'll come across one or two cases where a number of these problems on the bullet points um, above there um, have um, led to the evidence being undermined and criminal convictions being overturned. And of course, at the bottom there, possible sources of bias, but um, that, that's um, pretty self-evident as a possible source of unreliability. Um, now, um, now I'm going to get a little bit more into the, um, the, the legal elements. And um, what, what I've done here in a very rough and ready way, rough and ready way, really, is to distinguish different ways in which one might come to, one might fall down, if you like, um, or fall short of expectations, really, when one is exposed to the full glare of the criminal trial. Uh, or if one's been under undue pressure from one side or the other to, prevent, to present statistics in a way that supports certain conclusions rather than others. Now, there are three ways, I've divided up, it's, it, this is really just something that um, occurred off the top of my head, it may not work terribly well, but um, what I've done is distinguish three kinds of problem or issue that may crop up in relation to expert evidence given in criminal trials. One, of course, is subjective honesty. I mean, it, it, there's always a risk that someone will present data in a dishonest manner, but that, that, that's relatively small, one would hope, as a problem. It's always possible. Um, 
Now, secondly, there's what I call rather um, uh, obscurely subjective objective fairness. Now, what does that mean? Um, well, what that means is where you're not being dishonest. You, honestly, subjectively, believe that the data support a particular conclusion, but there is a dimension of objective fairness to what you're doing. In other words, there is, a, there is a, an aspect in which it could only be fair to present the data you honestly believe supports a conclusion if you put forward all the data, uh, even the bit that doesn't support you particularly well, or the bit you can't explain, or something like that. Um, that's the objective element in being fair when you present your evidence. It's not enough that you think the data support what you're saying, that you must have regard to the objective element of fairness too. Um, and finally, there's the, the, there is the purely objective question of reliability. Um, how, um, uh, well, whether it's purely objective may be open to question. I don't want to put too much stress on that. Um, but there is um, a basic question, if you like, about how reliable certain kinds of evidence is, irrespective of what you may think or what may be fair to the other person in terms of what you reveal about your um, work. There is just the basic question of objective reliability. So there are those three dimensions, all of which may uh, come into play uh, in one way or another, in criminal, or indeed for that matter, in civil cases. A lot of what I'm saying here will not be a special relevance to criminal cases, it will be relevant to civil cases too. I'll come back to that um, right at the end. Um, but obviously from my point of view, what's important about it is how it impacts on criminal cases. Um, now, second bullet point. Reliable enough, well, for what? Um, for what? For what? purposes need scientific evidence or other kinds of evidence be sufficiently reliable? Well, um, I think you need to distinguish a number of things. And one, for example, is scholarly speculation. Although, in fact, I could have just put speculation, I guess. But um, the scholarly bit is important here. Because um, whatever flaws may have been found in, for example, just to use that example, the UEA, uh, Climate Change Research Institute evidence, Whatever flaws there might have been, it seems to me it was um, uh, easily accurate enough for the basis of, at the very least, scholarly speculation or political debate or something like that. It was sufficiently reliable, even though the data were messy and various other things about it, for that kind of purpose. And um, the degree of reliability that something has to have in order to make a contribution of some kind to scholarly debate is not very high, uh, it seems to me. I mean, obviously, it can't be wholly unreliable, otherwise why would you be putting it forward? But it doesn't have to meet a very high criteria. I mean, that just seems to me to be a matter of common sense. But again, it's something that has caused difficulty in criminal cases and civil cases because, on occasion, articles written with scholarly speculation in mind have been used in other contexts and their conclusions spun out across a larger range of activity uh, where really they don't necessarily beyond, belong. Um, then there's civil litigation, of course, where one's concerned with whether something um, is provable on a balance of probabilities, and it may be that some evidence is appropriate for that purpose in a way it would not be in a criminal trial. So it might be, um, for example, that um, evidence of the way that, uh, and I'll come back to this example, evidence of the way that somebody walks um, the fact that they've got a distinctive kind of walk or gait um, might be sufficient for the purposes of identification in a civil case, but might not be sufficiently um, up to it for the purposes of a criminal case. And um, I hope I won't forget to come back to that example, because it's quite an interesting one, uh, a little bit later on. And finally, of course, we then have criminal litigation. And there are two bits to this, really. Um, criminal litigation, as you know, it all involves proof beyond reasonable doubt, and so your scientific evidence, if it's going to form a part of that, you might think, has to be, um, in terms of objective reliability, extremely um, highly reliable. Um, but of course, actually, the position is more complicated than that. Um, it certainly has to have an extremely high degree of reliability. If you are, um, to use the common phrase, the prosecution's star witness, if effectively the whole case would fall apart were it not for you and your evidence. And, of course, that's not uncommon in cases where, for example, DNA evidence is uh, concerned. And I'll come back again to that. Um, but, if you're, again, if your evidence is only supporting evidence, 
sort of suggestive. Uh, it supports the prosecution's case, but it's not the main bit of it. Well, then maybe the, the, the objective reliability of it does not have to be quite as high as that, as all that, so long as it's made clear, obviously, to the jury and to the court, um, what degree of reliability it does have. And again, things may be difficult on the defence side. If we turn things around, um, all the defence has to do, of course, as you know, is um, throw a bit of sand into the prosecution's face. All they have to do is to cast a bit of reasonable doubt on the conclusion. And it might be that a scientific theory of some kind, although um, you know, perhaps a little bit coming from left field, uh, is sufficient to do that. Um, so it's not always the case that when we're thinking about scientific evidence, we're thinking about, um, although even this is a dangerous example, uh, DNA evidence, which is thought to be uh, proof, beyond proof, really, uh, of an extremely high degree of reliability. Not all scientific evidence is like that, but it doesn't matter, necessarily, uh, for the purpose of the criminal trial. It depends what you're trying to do with it in that trial. Okay. Um, well, th there are some controversial cases that a number of you may know about here, and I don't really want to chew over the fact um, in relation to those um, in the course of my talk, although you may want to come back to them in, in questioning, and that's fine. Um, Certainly, in one of the um, expert, prosecution experts in the Sally Clark case, you remember, which um, was a, a, a cop death case where more, there was more than one cop death in the same family, and the implication was that it, it, for that reason, uh, it could not actually, it, might, it was not actually cop death, and there was a, um, an implication of criminal intent. Uh, now, um, one of the prosecution experts failed to disclose the test result for one of the two infants involved. Now, um, at the very least, I suggest, that transgresses what I called the subject of objective element of fairness. That expert might have thought that that doesn't matter, um, that it's really unhelpful to disclose that evidence or whatever it may be. Um, but in a, as a matter of objective fairness, it should have been disclosed. Um, Another expert in the Clark case faced what I referred to earlier on as the messy data problem. Um, that is that um, this expert did not allude to the fact that cop death can be affected by environmental and genetic factors, um, as well as um, where, this, where the baby is positioned in the cot or not in the cot next to the mother or whatever it may be. In other words, sort of personal care issues. It can be affected by a wide range of issues. Um, now, in saying that, I'm, I'm not purporting to be an expert on this. I'm merely, this is sort of 78th hand reporting or something. But I'm, what I'm, the, pur the purpose of mentioning it is to give you some examples of how um, we can run into the kind of problems I mentioned earlier on in real life cases. Um, now, um, that was the, uh, the, the, the the first point there on the, uh, the bullet point just simply explains, I think, the fairness issue in a little bit more detail, um, uh, in that he failed to give a warning of the possible other influential factors. Um, Canning's um, similar kind of case, but a, a, a different problem, I think, ari arising. This, uh, this is what I referred to earlier on as, as, as the question of whether the, the reliability element was fit for purpose. In other words, fit for the main prosecution evidence in the trial. Um, and here we have the alleged dogma, as it was called, that two or more unexplained infant deaths equals non-accidental death, something um, of that nature. I may have put it rather crudely, but now, again, that is something which um, could be quite interesting as a hypothesis tried out in a journal or something of that nature, perhaps even of relevance to a civil case, but probably, indeed almost certainly, not enough really if you're going to be the star witness um, for the prosecution. Uh, because in fact, the probability that that is true um, is very much lower than um, was being suggested. And again, the Harris case, a similar thing, different issue, um, non-accidental head injury being inferred from a particular constellation or triad of um, intracranial injuries. And here again, something that's very suggestive, the presence of these um, intracranial injuries in a certain pattern, very suggestive, but the problem is there was no way of knowing whether it was sufficiently reliable for a criminal case. In fact, it probably wasn't. Sufficient perhaps for other purposes, not for the main evidence in the prosecution's case. So what are the lessons so far? 
well. Um, a great deal of expertise makes assumptions about matters outside its field. I mentioned that right at the start. And if you're going to give expert evidence, do not conceal inconvenient data. Better have it out in the open right at the beginning and explain it away rather than not having it there at all. Um, be alert to the purposes for which data may or may not prove reliable. Um, as I said, what's fine for scholarly speculation is a long way from what can pass muster if you're the star witness in the prosecution case. Now, that is not to criticise, I should heavily underline, the experts in Cannings, Harris, those cases, from giving their evidence. Their evidence might have been all right, actually, as, as supporting evidence, had there been some other evidence which was really the lead evidence for the prosecution. Might have been all right there. Um, with an appropriate health law. Um, but unfortunately, it, it loomed rather larger than that, which is where the problems began. Now, um, what are we doing in this project? I've mentioned some of that already, um, that our aim is to reform the basis on which expert evidence is admissible. But the reason why I've divided this lecture into two halves, and I've given you now the first half, is that, in fact, um, we at the Law Commission have not been particularly concerned with eminent experts who give um, evidence in criminal trials where really the, 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 the reliability of the evidence is not enough for the purpose in hand. We have addressed those issues, but actually the larger part of our consultation and report is about something rather different. Rather different. And you'll note from the title of my lecture science, pseudoscience and statistics, but in fact, a very large part of what we have been concerned with is what is at the boundaries of science and pseudoscience, if I can put it in that way. How do you know if someone comes along claiming that they can tell from a nose print who someone is, for example, um, all right, are they an expert? Are they a scientist? I mean, well, what are they? I mean, how, how do you know? Should they just be treated in the same way as an identification witness who claims they saw the person at the scene of the crime? Um, or should they actually be treated as an expert? Um, not an easy question to answer, but very, very important one. Uh, because in the criminal law and in the law generally, um, expert has very broad um, compass or remit, um, or broad meaning, I should say, more properly. It includes, for example, police officers who are, as they claim anyway, um, much better at identifying people from CCTV video because they spend hours and hours and hours doing it. Um, so in other words, their expertise comes from experience, not from scholarly learning and so on and so forth. Um, uh, such people may be treated as experts in the criminal courts. Um, now, um, I'm not saying that um, CCTV evidence and identification drawn therefrom is pseudoscience, but I think um, some scientists in the audience might raise an eyebrow at the thought that it might be regarded as expert evidence of a kind. But in the law account, and what we have said about these kinds of cases is that expert evidence should only be admissible if the trial judge, before the trial begins, in fact, um, or at the preliminary stage, should only allow, the trial judge should be the gatekeeper and should only allow the evidence in if persuaded um, or satisfied that it's sufficiently reliable to be led. And to that end, the judge should be assisted by guidelines, and I won't go into this because it's a technical um, sideline, but uh, if need be, by a court expert, where it really is outside the scope even of the judge's um, ability to comprehend. But the onus in our proposals will be on experts, or those who claim to be experts, um, producing their own background methodology, literature, um, as far as it can be boiled down in a re to a reasonable degree, which supports their claim to be an expert, or indeed, um, it's a bit like going back to trial by ordeal, um, having experts actually test it. Um, all right, um, the judge will say, uh, Mr. Soto, you claim you're a lit reader? Right, well, we'll have a little trial, shall we? And we'll all get us get a series of people to say the same thing, and can you tell what they're saying? Now, I'm not suggesting that the judge would do it in that way, because, of course, the statistical significance of just doing a handful of people might be too low. But it would certainly be possible, in some instances, uh, and appropriate, to see whether lip readers can actually do the business. Can these police officers who claim to identify people actually do it with a random sample of people put in front of them um, in that way? The judges should get more involved in doing that sort of thing before this, allowed, this evidence is allowed to go forward. 
Now, um, I don't want to bore you with um, statements of the present law and so on, but the present law is, um, relies very heavily, perhaps not surprisingly, as the bold element in there indicates, on expertise being part of a body of knowledge or experience, sufficiently organised or recognised to be accepted as a body, a reliable body of experience. So um, the law, at least in theory, relies on um, consensus opinion, if you like, which is a, a, a sort of safe haven, if you like, for judges when deciding something is um, a matter of expertise. Um, now, um, one of the problems about that is that um, not, only do, um, not only is it ignored quite widely in some cases, um, the fact that the subject matter of the opinion must be part of a body of knowledge and experience, um, but also in, in this case at bottom there, Luttrell, the Court of Appeal, Court of Appeal rejected the view that in order to be admissible, there's a preliminary requirement that um, the expert be tested as to their methodology and the foundations of what they're saying. They said, no, 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 you, you, um, there's no preliminary requirement that that can be tested in cross-examination. And so, um, to come back to the question of gate analysis, or the analysis of how you walk, uh, there was a case, it's part of the consultation, an old baby judge um, wrote to me and said, we well, might be rather interested in this case I had to try last week, um, in which um, uh, an expert, or a yeah. lady expert came along and said, um, well, I know it was the defendant because um, if you look at the CCTV of him running away, you can see he runs in this particular sort of a way, I don't know, dragging his left leg or whatever the evidence uh, is. And um, here we've got some CCTV of him running, as he was requested to do, from A to B by um, the um, prosecution, or however they got the evidence, I'm not sure. We know it's him in the second one. And if you look at the way that he runs, I mean, it's quite obviously him. Quite obviously. Um, well, the judge said, hmm, I was very dubious about this. But the problem was, you know, there I was as a judge, faced with luck and light. I couldn't say to him, well, look, you know, how, how do you, what's the scientific basis of this? I mean, how, how do you know? I mean, uh, yes, to the common garden person it looks the same. But I mean, what, does it have a, I mean, have you got anything more than just an ordinary person's, you know, I wasn't able to do that, you see. Um, that's what I'm about for. So I, I let it go forward. He said, you know what happened? He said, the, um, the, the, the jury acquitted, and they, came, they sent me a note. And the note said, um, what, what did you think you were doing with that ridiculous evidence? We, we, we just had to discount it straight away. I mean, we can't understand why it was admitted. Um, so, there we are. Um, but he said, well, that, that, I mean, if what you're doing as well, could help to stop that kind of um, uh, absurdity occurring, that would be great. But again, I don't rule out the possibility that that kind of evidence could tip the balance as part of um, uh, supporting evidence for something more major. Possibly. Um, it's not inconceivable. But it was wrong, actually, irresponsible, to try to use it as a main bit to the prosecution's case. Um, now, um, various problems. I dealt with the Cannings and Harris cases. Um, and um, one of the problems I mentioned earlier on when I talked about the text and the law's reliance on a body of experience is that actually, of course, um, the trouble with relying on a body of experience is that what the courts have got in mind here is evidence for the prosecution. You want to be sure, really sure, that evidence is reliable if, if it's going to form part of the case for the prosecution. But actually, I suggested to you, I'm not sure that that is really or should be the test when you're talking about expert evidence used by the defence. Who are said, all they have to do is throw a bit of sand in the prosecution's face. They don't have to prove anything. Um, so they, it seems to me, should be given a little bit more latitude um, to use minority opinion. Um, and if the minority opinion is um, pretty absurd, and indeed there's one case in which um, the defence called an 80-year-old alleged expert from Australia to show or suggest that a baby with cranial injuries in fact died of scurvy, um, <laughs> which seemed a little bit unlikely. But um, uh, uh, now, that kind of case um, clearly is well beyond the sorts of um, uh, expertise that one, that the court of has in mind when it must be drawing on a body of experience and so on about um, cranial injuries. I mean, I'll come back to that case in a moment. But there are, I think, different ways in which this can, be, can and should be approached, depending on whether you are appearing for prosecution or defense. Here are some um, areas where this issue has cropped up. And it, it has to be said, it's increased 
Um, I don't say every single criminal case involves at least some expert evidence. That would be wrong. But it's probably not, a, not, not, probably not far away to say that a majority do um, in some way, shape, or form. Probably. I mean, I mean, there's no way of knowing. There's no statistics. I don't believe me. I've tried to find out. But there's no way of knowing, um, as far as I can tell. But it's becoming more and more significant. Judges are telling us this. Voice identification are based on auditory comparison. So, sounds like. Um, is that a field of expertise? If so, how reliable is it? Again, you ought to be able to test that, really, before it gets into court. Handwriting comparison, well, that goes back a long way, of course. Um, diagnoses of battered women's syndrome, repression theory of sex abuse memory, gait comparison, well, I've talked about that. Dallaher is a well-known case, that's a great one, really. Um, that was a case of ear prints. Um, a man was accused of um, very serious crime, and the allegation, the evidence against him was that he'd left his ear print on the window of the house in which the crime took place. And two, I think, earprint experts came along to say, yes, it's definitely here, definitely. Um, and, of course, he was convicted, and, well, you can see the conclusion cantering over the horizon, can't you? Which was that when they finally got some DNA, DNA evidence, it proved it wasn't him. Um, <laughs> and the reason why the error occurred was that, um, was not that these people were charlatans or anything like that, no, no, um, but their, their um, points of comparison about the ear were, I can't remember the exact figure, but let's say they were eight-point comparisons. Whereas if in the case they called a fingerprint expert to say, well, what would you regard as reliable, the fingerprint expert would have said, well, eight points of comparison? No way! I mean, that's not nearly good enough, because the error rate would be too high. You need something like a 12 or a 16 point or something of that nature. Um, and that would have cast much more doubt, I think, on, on the confident assertions of the experts in that case. Um, I mentioned DNA evidence. Now, DNA evidence is often absolutely central to the prosecution's case. And so there are particular issues about the reliability of this evidence. And I've drawn down here from um, the CPS guidelines for low copy number DNA evidence what they now say about this. And as you can see, there are actually quite a number of checks in place that the CPS now have to make sure that this evidence is not, which is so powerful and persuasive when it gets into court, is not, um, in the end, unreliable. And you can see here qualifications, procedures in the lab, um, does the evidence involve composite results? That's the messy data problem um, coming back. Um, the interpretation of the results, that's another issue which Professor Han raised with us in the consultation paper, although I didn't mention it. Um, that sometimes when confronted with data which are actually quite good, the way that they're interpreted by the expert is wrong. Um, so that's another thing that has to be checked. Um, so um, I'm glad, I hope you're reassured to see that the Crown Prosecution Service is actually alive to the possibility of um, errors in being made in the way that DNA is kept and then presented. Um, and um, it's quite clear that there is a need, I think, to try and get a grip on this problem. And it's pointed out by the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee, who wanted a way of testing whether the theories are sufficiently robust, and so on. And this actually relates to something in Rule 702 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, a much discussed rule, um, where in embryonic form, not in a very sophisticated form, but in embryonic form, there is something along the lines that we would like. That is, that um, there should be um, some way of testing the theory or technique. Has it appeared in peer review and publication, that kind of thing, been tested out in that way? Um, what is the known or potential error rate? That's number three there. Um, but number four, they, they sort of go back into their bolt hole, really, rather like the English course, and say, oh, well, uh, widespread acceptance is very important. Um, and minimal support should be viewed sceptically. Well, as I said, maybe that's true for the prosecution, but not all. Um, now, what our provisionally proposed solution involved basically following that case I mentioned, Dalbert, the, um, the American case I just looked at. And we are proposing a gatekeeping role for the trial judge, um, involving a discretion to exclude what might otherwise be quite relevant evidence on the grounds that it's unreliable. And there are going to be guidelines on reliability, what that, that means. And as I said earlier on, I'm not looking into this here, 
in difficult cases, the judge could have the power to call on an independent assessor, although we think those cases would be extremely rare um, in some very arcane fields of statistics or whatever it may be. Um, but that's not something I want to go into today. Um, now, the way that this breaks down is that, um, the, in general, the, as I said, the expert, the evidence must be admissible only if the court deems it sufficiently reliable. And as a question of law, the, ed the evidence must be credi predicated on sound principles and assumptions, um, techniques, and so on. In other words, um, no astrology, essentially, uh, no science of that nature. Um, but um, beyond that, this is not meant to be too stringent a text, um, other than ruling out things like astrology. Um, I mean, I think one can rely in general terms on the prosecution not to bring or the defense to be not to present someone as an expert unless they meet at least this minimum question. But it nonetheless is an important one to have out in the open. Then there's the question, have the principles been properly applied to the case? Now, you might say, well, um, why should the judge be concerned with that? Well, there's a case called Guilfoyle in which um, an evidence of a psychologist was called to suggest that um, a person, a victim of um, murder, as, had, uh, as they were, at following the conviction of the defendant for the murder, might actually have committed suicide instead. But this psychologist had not examined the, uh, not uh, examined the defendant or asked any questions about um, the case, uh, was doing it purely from a view of the documents, and really the court of appeal said they had absolutely no way, the psychologists, of being able to apply <coughs> the principles that they had um, wanted to put in evidence about predisposition to commit suicide. They had no way of applying that to the actual facts of the case in a proper manner. And so that evidence was simply excluded as, in, as just not sufficiently um, up to the mark. Um, and um, the evidence is, that is the evidence that the expert gives must be supported by those principles as applied to the facts of the case. In other words, um, it's no good being an expert on A if actually the principles in, um, in play or relevance are um, to do with subject matter B. Um, that will not do. Now, um, in terms of responses, uh, as I said, we had over 80 individuals and organisations, um, mainly supportive of the general idea, although um, a lot of devil remains in the detail. And I thought I'd just take them through a selection of some of the observations that they mentioned um, in the course of consultation. I mean, it's, it's obviously very selective, but um, it's quite a substantial document, the um, responses to consultation. One solicitor said, well, shouldn't there be a warning to the jury that expert evidence can be wrong? Um, rather as there's a warning about identification evidence of that kind. Um, and in fact, we think that's rather a good suggestion, and that probably uh, there ought, if not in all cases, at least where the judge thinks it appropriate, for such a warning. Perhaps particularly where the evidence is central to the case, it might be sensible to have such a warning. Um, not what lawyers call a full corroboration warning, but nonetheless, um, which will um, allow for a bit of nostalgia on the part of those who studied this before um, the rules have changed. But um, a, a nonetheless, a warning that the expert evidence can be wrong in certain cases. Um, another campaigner said, in death, child death and injury cases, the expert should come from a separate health authority. Well, that's a bit outside, I would admit. But nonetheless, an interesting suggestion. Um, now, here are some more detailed things, some of which we have actually added to our recommendations. Um, Attention to possible variations in the meaning of the opinion or its wording. Well, yes, certainly where you've got a, a doc documentary evidence, that's true. You may need to um, cross-examine the, the expert on that. Um, the confidence with which the expert um, is expressing himself. Now, that is important, actually. and We, we don't look that, I think, at, at first when we consulted, and we are going to include something on that. One of the problems in the Dallaher case, the earprint evidence, was that the experts really were very confident about it. They did not express the ifs and buts and the hesitations that one might have looked for, perhaps. Um, and no doubt that's because they were, um, they had the sort of CPS prosecutor with a hand behind their back, sort of urging them to remain confident. Um, but that is a, a very important factor uh, to bear in mind. Um, 
Does the opinion address other explanations? Also very important, I think, that um, in other words, as an expert, and this is a well-known phenomenon but easily forgotten, you should not consider yourself purely an expert for the prosecution or the defence and concentrate only on the evidence that supports it. Then uh, there should be um, attention paid to other possible explanations that you know of. Um, now, this is something we couldn't deal with. The proposal should be extended to civil proceedings. For example, proceedings um, in relation to taking children into care, for example, um, that may be based on expert evidence that a child has been abused physically or something of that nature. Um, should there be some testing of the experts who give evidence in that context? Well, quite plausibly, but a bit outside our admit. Um, then some more, um, uh, uh, then some other suggestions, not, I won't take you through all of those, not all of which we've um, actually adopted or um, will propose or recommend. Um, now, um, Another interesting one was that our, for lawyers anyway, that our proposal should apply to expert assessments that an offender is dangerous at the sentencing stage. Crucial, obviously, for the offender, because if they are so labelled, they're going to end up with, a pre, uh, with an indeterminate sentence or something pretty substantial. Um, but, um, again, should one be able to test the credentials of the expert in dangerousness before the evidence comes in at that stage? Pretty important. Um, so, we've broadened out the scope a little bit of what we um, we're talking about. We were literally, originally just talking about reliability, but now in one day, we are we should also, I think, include as part of the things that the judge should be testing for competence, impartiality, strength of opinion, a very important one in my view, and the necessity of the evidence for the juror to understand and decide, really. Um, some other things that I think are less relevant perhaps for this audience, but um, uh, not, we drew a distinction originally between scientific and non-scientific expertise, but that proved not terribly workable. Um, now, there will have to be testing, I mentioned that, but um, sometimes, of course, it's not always possible to test expertise um, before you get into court. And in that case, the judge will have to take a view just purely on the person's qualifications or experience or whatever it may be. So we're not imposing a rigid test that everyone reporting to be an expert must produce a great sheaf of papers of proof of their methodology. It's not designed to work in that bureaucratic way. Um, now, um, here, if I can focus on bullet point three, I've, already, I've stressed already the importance of the defence not having to go through the same hoops as the prosecution, who of course have to prove the case to a much higher standard. Now, what, what we're running with here is the idea that if all the defence wants to do is punch holes in the prosecution's case, and um, in cross-examination say, um, well, I, I put it to you, Professor Soto, that in fact your data are not as reliable as you claim them to be, and uh, in fact uh, it only shows a 70% pro possibility or probability of the defendant being guilty. Is that not so? Uh, and that kind of thing. Um, you, you're perfectly entitled to do that without having to um, show the grounds of your own uh, um, basis for saying so. Otherwise the thing would become too unwieldy. However, what I think we will be insisting on is that there are, the judge applies these tests of reliability if the defence goes beyond just trying to rebut the prosecution's case and introduces a new scientific theory of its own to explain um, the course of events, as in the scurvy example that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, there, I think, one would have to um, have a test of the, the expertise of the person called to give that evidence. And I've mentioned also the judicial duty to consider a ward. That's also something we're incorporating. Um, so, specific considerations for experts, if I could just finish there. Um, in future, experts are going to have to be prepared to come along and defend their methodology and not just their evidence. And there will be a role, I think, here for professional bodies in producing guidelines as to what you should come to court with. Um, Clearly, it's no good coming with a great pile of textbooks and articles and so on, which is the foundation of your entire knowledge. That would be unreasonable and not helpful anyway. Um, so there's going to be a role for expert bodies, I think, in um, working out exactly what is going to be useful and sufficient for courts to test reliability. Um, there will, of course, be disclosure obligations, as there um, currently are in any event. And um, the overriding duty is to the court. Now, I know that's already a, um, a requirement, and we know that. Um, but um, it's important, I think, that experts are as alive to the possibility of 
the case being explained on some other basis as the basis on which they've been asked or requested to, to, to explain it. I think that is important, um, really, in the context of how expert evidence is used. Oh, well, I've slightly run over time. I, I apologize for that. But um, I will be very happy to take any questions you may have. And it's been a pleasure to lecture you. Extremely good point. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the, the problem at the moment is that um, it's all left to be tested in cross examination in accordance with the adversarial tradition. But that, as you yourself say, is not happening in a very satisfactory way. Um, but uh, it will undoubtedly be the case that as a result, if our proposals are adopted by government, there will, of course, have to be training not just for judges who will be adopting a very um, significant role but also for advocates, because advocates will have to come along and be prepared to um, persuade the court, along with their expert, that the evidence should be admitted. So they are going to have to be up on it, if you like, uh, already, if, in any case where this is going to be an issue. But I'm afraid that you can't um, make provision for absolutely everything. And whilst it will certainly be true, I think, that barristers are going to have to become more uh, adept at um, questioning methodology and challenging it in court because the judge will be required to do that right from the start in any event. There are going to be these gaps in knowledge. I mean, almost inevitably, I think. Um, I mean, we're very happy to co collaborate, I think, from professionals and be very, you know, particularly in my area, we're very keen to speak with courts about this. I'm not sure with the Royal College of Earprints informed yet, and it's, it's no. not enough organisation ability to work closely with the courts about that field, so ultimately that will have to go back to the, and I'm not sure if you've produced anything on paper to those two guys who stood up in that case, who really presented such strong feelings there, whether the people who, who come from those, field, those fields will back down, again, it's, I think it's back, up, back down to the barristers. Well, it is, um, but I think that the, uh, what, what we're trying to take this in a sort of stage way, I and mean, I think that um, there are already actually quite a number of rules bearing on criminal procedure which relate to the preparation of expert reports and so on and how they are presented. There's already quite a lot there, but uh, what there is lacking is, is a test that the judge applies to screen out, um, or at least to moderate how the evidence is being, is being presented. Because the judge might say, well, look, of the earprint people, well, um, I can see that this has some basis. I mean, it has a scientific basis. But you're surely not going to put that forward as your only evidence, are you? Because if so, um, well, uh, <laughs> the case isn't really going to get a lot further. Um, you're going to have to go back and come up with some other evidence, or, or in some other way, because it's just not reliable for that purpose. Um, and um, I, I, I think we would pr what we are anticipating, therefore, is a more prominent role for the judge, right at the very beginning, to try and screen out the worst examples of this. But there still will be an important role for the advocate. And um, you're right, I mean, they may still fall down in their duties, but they will not be immune from the, 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 the drift of these changes should they come through. There will be a, a sense in which they'll be expected to take a more uh, knowledgeable line in cross examination and to have, to have discussed with the experts what the other side are likely to say. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I should have thought they'd normally do this in any event, actually, but it just may be in some instances it doesn't work that way. Gentlemen in the. Thank you. Um, 
How would you respond to criticisms such as those expressed by Chief Justice Rehnquist in Dubair itself that out of visibility um, rules such as this, they place too much reliance on the judge to become amateur scientists, and ultimately they, they don't have that capacity to do so, and um, the subsequent empirical research that has been carried out that yeah. this rule is just applied, applied um, indistinctly and a lot of evidence gets through anyway? Sure. Now, that's a perfectly fair um, observation and, and, a, and a challenge to me. I mean, in a, in a, the, in a broad sense, um, uh, we have to try and get a little bit beyond the sort of general maxim that one of the benefits of university education is that you know when someone's talking rot, because um, that obviously isn't always true. Uh, you might not in these kinds of cases. Um, but um, I think that where I would take issue with um, Chief Justice Rehnquist would be the idea that judges are expected to be amateur scientists. I mean, that's not what we're anticipating, or amateur statisticians or whatever. What they are meant to be, to use um, a pithy phrase one of the scholars uses, is, is intelligent consumers of science, if I can put it in that way. In other words, they're perfectly entitled to say, um, look, Mr. Sanzo, you're, this is all going over my head. You, you've got to try and show me in sort of language that I can reasonably understand. Well, what, what, how does this methodology work? You know, what? what how have you tested it? How do you know, satisfy me, basically? Um, now, um, so in other words, the onus would be on the judge proactively to, um, to get the expert to show them how they can get an intelligible critique or uh, assessment of the evidence. Um, now, that may not be easy to do, but that's what we're aiming for, if you like. And that's what, uh, in fact, the expert bodies that we talked to have said, well, actually, that is possible. Won't be easy, and what's more, we will insist on being paid for it, but um, it is actually possible to do that. Um, there are only some areas, we think, that they said, where actually the thing is so arcane that you probably couldn't. Um, it just wouldn't be reasonable to expect something to put in ordinary, put something in, in language that an ordinary judge could understand, it just can't be done. Um, and that's why we have the expert assessor provision, but that's quite controversial in a number of ways, and um, it's quite a difficult proposition. <coughs> But I didn't want to focus on it today because it's not our main um, point. But there will be provision, as I say, for an expert assessor for those sorts, for the rare sorts of cases where you really can't um, explain something in a way that the judge can adopt a critical angle or take decisions about it. Um, I'm sure Chief, Chief Justice Greg would have hated that even more. <laughs> but um, uh, not, nonetheless, you know, I'm not here to account to him, fortunately. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I walk into the use of statistics as a lawyer, as an academic lawyer. Um, and I um, read the Clark, um, the, the first judgment in um, Clark, and after yes. the first opinion, in which um, um, Clark was, um, the, the conviction was affirmed. I read it after, after the event, and I think that decision is probably, I mean, it, it is, I, I found it very alarming. Mm. Um, and the reason being, actually, it's not because it's a bad decision, or it's a bad judgment, actually, because it's such a thorough, um, a detailed analysis of both um, the evidence and, and the law involved. Um, and nevertheless, they, they got it wrong eventually in terms of, of, um, of the result. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I, I, I'm still not sure what to make of this um, kind of event, but I think um, I would expect much more um, kind of um, concern and worrying and, and kind of attempts to slightly more radical reforms of the issue of expert evidence based on um, this um, um, wrongful conviction. Um, and two, I think, general issues which, which come across. The first one is, um, I mean, I, I want to focus on the statistics. Um, the first one is about the kind of the perception that it was the kind of the main evidence or the only evidence, etc. And I think once you finish reading the prosecution case, you realize it was really a sideshow, as the um, first court, I think, um, rightly pointed out. Um, and it, the problem is not only about this particular, it's, it's not local. That issue, um, and you realise. I mean, I think that it might be the right kind of um, 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 how the example or the um, multi to consider um, how kind of basic notions such as reasonable doubt and, and the presumption of innocence work. Because once you read the case of the court, I mean, you put aside the statistics, you nevertheless, um, I think, left wondering how come um, with all these allegedly strong defences of the accused. Um, and so many doubts running in the court and received such a thorough examination, how come um, the accused was still convicted at the end? Um, so that's one thing, I think, which is, um, should be examined. And I think the 
second thing is the issue of expert evidence in particular. Um, and that's, I would expect that type of cases to lead to much more skepticism amongst the legal um, profession towards the, um, the experts. Um, and, the, and, and to kind of consider, I think, more thoroughly the, the legal questions arising. For that sake, the statistics, for example, Assuming that it was um, just for, I mean, in, in an alternative case, that if the statistics were gathered and analyzed in the utmost um, professional manner and everything would be um, arrived according to the uh, statistician, I think the questions for us remain as forceful as they were before. So if the numbers were reduced substantially, is that still good evidence to be used for the defendant's um, purpose? Or if they were still just slightly not 1 per 73 million, but 1 per 23 million, or whatever the number would have been? Um, is that still a good evidence to use in general, not only as a supporting case, um, not, not only as a key evidence, but also as a supporting case, as it were, I think, in the Salish Arctic. So, overall, I think there are many more questions, um, but, but I think overall, um, I mean, going back to the Dalbert um, principles is, is a good start, maybe, but I, I think that the issue of experts, and I think comparing to other um, um, legal systems, the, the amount of um, trust and respect they received amongst lawyers in this country um, might, I think, be um, questionable, and maybe that type of reform is not appropriate. Yes, well, I, 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 you're right. I mean, I think the, the, the gist of what you're getting at is that I think you have to be very careful in papers like these from quite a bodies like the Law Commission not to say things like, well, if our proposals had been in place, of course this case would have been decided differently like Clark or something like that. Now, we, we, I'm pretty confident we don't say that anywhere. Um, and we'd be very foolish if we did, um, because you, there is no guarantee, actually, that even if um, our proposals have been in place, that the particular errors that were fallen into there would not have, been, would not have happened. I mean, it was a strange concatenation of, of, of circumstances and things that went wrong. Um, but what, so, in a way, cases for us are, are suggestive of problems. Um, I mean, sometimes you can put forward a recommendation, you can say, well, what we need to do is get rid of the effect of that case, and then just... Uh, you, uh, but that's normally when it sets out a rule of some kind. But Clark wasn't like that. I mean, Clark was just a bad decision. Um, and it went on for a number of connected, inter interconnected reasons. And um, it's only really one or two of those that we're trying to, to address. Um, I mean, that's why, in a way, I, I started off by looking at Clark, not from the point of view of the statistical stuff, which everyone's very familiar with, but actually from the point of view of the experts themselves and what they should have been saying, actually, um, and what their duties were to the court with respect to the inconvenient data, uh, if you like, or the broader picture, um, but which they may feel it's not their point, it's not their role to um, pronounce on, whereas in fact, I think it is. Um, I mean, in a way, an expert should, to some extent, be a fly in the ointment for the barrister, because the barrister should really get wanting them to say A, but the expert should be saying, well, Yes, all right, I'm prepared to come along and say A, but I'm not going to say A unless you allow me to mention B, because unless, unless even though B might muddy the waters, because unless I mention B, you can't really set A in a proper context. Um, and it, it, it's that kind of um, possibility, I think, that one has to be very careful about. Um, and to some extent, that's already being addressed, actually, um, in the way that expert reports are put forward um, and dealt with by advocates in cases. Um, so there's already been quite a lot of response, I think, to these problems at a high level. Um, but you can't guarantee that any of the cases actually we're looking at would be dealt with in a, uh, a different way. We just, we just hope that over a period of time it would be. Robert Tarska. My name's Robert. Uh, I've been an expert on a few cases, and uh, I've also just recently been stuck in Hong Kong for 11 days. And what surprised me was we saw all these experts on the TV talking about volcanoes and this and that. And it's as though they've just been wheeled out. They've got their 15 minutes of fame. And they were so enthusiastic. But actually what they weren't good at was giving an opinion and interpreting. They were good at just characterizing the data or the information. And from the talk, I didn't see how you were going to address the complete mismatch between your field and our field as experts, that we're enthusiastic about what we do, and we're just simply not trained in the way that you are. In that what, what we're trained in is the sort of scholarly speculation. And how do you deal with that complete mismatch and problem? Because whatever you want, I, 
you know, I've been in court a number of times, and, and I just noticed it the whole time. That this is like two worlds clashing, and how do you get sense out of that? And what seems to come across to me is that it's, it's the person with the most forceful opinion or way of presenting themselves, irrespective of whether what they're saying is true or not, mm. that looks the best. And there's no way that you can get around that. It just looks better. Well, so how I, do you deal with all of that? Well, I'd, I'd like to, I mean, I would want to reinforce that point, I think, because I think one of the problems in jury trials is that juries equate the expression of doubt or reservation with someone being a not particularly reliable witness. Um, and they equate confidence, although not overconfidence clearly, but, but good presentation, confident presentation, as actually evidence that what you're saying is more reliable. Um, whereas, of course, whilst that might be true, of course, it equally might not be true. Um, well, I, um, I think it's quite, we, we've tried to steer away a little bit in our report from what you might call trial techniques and the problems about idiosyncrasies in particular witnesses. Because one obvious answer to the point you made is, ah, well, what you need to have, therefore, is experts who are experienced at giving evidence in criminal cases and understand that, well, but there are both <coughs> of that too. Because one of the problems is they then get captured, if you like, by the prosecution or the defence. And they always come along and give the same basic sort of stuff, more and more confidently and professionally and expertly. Um, and that can have its own problems too, actually. Um, uh, can have a distorting effect on the way that um, when defendants decide whether or not to plead guilty as advised by their advocates. It, it can, it, it, it's not an unmixed um, blessing, I think. Um, so I, I very like the problem that you mentioned, certainly. Um, and I think we were, very, we were very clear here that our paper is purely about um, the reliability in a, um, in a provable sense, if you like, of, of the, the basis of an expert opinion. That dealing with problems in cross-examination of people's confidence and so on, um, to a certain extent you can address that if it emerges out of the reliability criteria. Um, I mentioned that already, that, that confidence must be matched to questions of reliability. But no one can, the judge can't control what happens once you get into the, uh, the witness box and start giving your evidence. Um, uh, or at least only to a limited extent can you say, well, you know, I'm not sure you should be expressing things as confidently as that or something, because that's now trespassing on the job of counsel to the other side, isn't it? So there, there are sort of two separate phases of this. I mean, pro the, the problem about worlds colliding is, is a problematic one, but actually we found, when I was doing a different project on murder, we were looking at diminished responsibility and evidence that <clears throat> experts give there on um, mental disorder. Actually, what was helpful was that some uh, experts who were used to giving um, evidence in criminal cases, and in some cases had actually legal qualifications, were prepared to sit around the table with their colleagues, explain exactly what the nature of the problem was that we had from a legal point of view, and then say, well, look, how can we help the Law Commission to make some suggestions that make sense to us uh, and that will make our job a little bit easier in terms of what we're expected to say when we come to court? And that is a way to at least get some element of overlap between the worlds. But the problem with that is that we were talking there about a very specific kind of evidence, evidence about mental disorder. Whereas in this project, obviously, we're dealing with everything from police officers looking at video screens through to pathologists or, uh, well, the whole range. And it's a bit harder to do that, actually. Sure. I, I want to talk about baby shaking case and a few observations, if you don't mind, from a, a lawyer's point of view. I've done a number of the cases, both as a, a barrister and as a judge. Indeed, I cross-examined Dr. Tasker. I hope I'm not one of those who missed the most of the point. <laughs> I am a firm believer in juries, and I do not have any difficulty in thinking that juries can read through the overconfident witness. I don't think we really need to worry about that because they're perfectly sensible people. And in practically every case, I have complete faith in juries, but not in baby-shaking cases. And the reason for that is because the evidence is simply so complicated. I've just done one in Cambridge with nine experts giving evidence, all extremely distinguished and all having entirely contradictory views. And I think that some way has to be devised of us putting more things by agreement to a jury. You said having the informal meeting and then giving the jury a, a document we're saying what the issues are, defining the issues. We did that in the case in Cambridge. 
So Cambridge is well ahead of the field, obviously, and that's so sort of clear. As is so rather many of them. Of course. <laughs> but the reality is it was still too complicated for a jury to understand. And I think there was a heavy responsibility on the doctors. How do you get so many doctors from the same field to disagree? The Royal College of Pathologists got together in December of last year to try and reach some agreed thing. The total amount of their agreement was, well, we must look very carefully at cases which involve very young babies. And that's really the whole extent of it after a day or two of meeting. Also, if you don't mind me saying so, this is not meant to be a, a have a go at doctors, um, but I think there's how you go at lawyers back. They do talk techno babble. I said to the jury in Cambridge, when you say anterior, do you mean towards the front? And they said, yes. And when you say posterior, do you mean the back? Yes. But would you mind using front and back? No, they said, we won't. And they refused. So somehow we have to get the witnesses to simplify as well. Otherwise, we have to find some way of giving the jury a clear medical picture. You cannot expect jurors, 12 of them, sitting there, who haven't had the reports, who have no knowledge at all of any of it, to reach these very difficult decisions on it. And I think that, if I may say so, where the Law Commission actually needs to be going, rather than just having more and more experts coming along to give evidence, which is where we go there. Just I, well, um, what can I say? I, I mean, you're right, of course, but I, I would have myself thought that actually, with questions like, Anterior, posterior, and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's a trivial example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it, it's partly <laughs> the job. It isn't it part of the job of the advocate to translate <laughs> this stuff into theory? It's incredibly boring. <laughs> Every time you say long word, you put it in English. And they say, do you mean that? And they say, yes. So you, you might say, well, couldn't you have said that the first time? Yeah. Well, that may be true. I mean, that's a bit outside our initial. That, that, that is trivial. Like, yeah, no, it's not necessarily true, but it, because I mean, if the jury would mix the two up, it could be absolutely um, uh, <laughs> very serious. <laughs> but um, uh, no, I, I, it's not. But it, it's slightly different to what clearly our report is about. It's about the scientific status of certain kinds of discipline and how reliable they really are, um, rather than what actually may occur at trials and so on. So, um, I mean, you, you're right. But in some respect, and this is true of the law, it is very other discipline, that there are. You do need technical terms for things um, uh, in certain instances. Uh, I mean, you can do a certain amount by getting rid of Latin and um, all that sort of thing and talking about faults in certain membrane and so on. But at some point, you are going to need um, technical language to describe some things. And that's true across the board, isn't it? Okay, but that's, that's not the main thrust. The main thrust is we have to get some way of getting on these difficult areas more agreement. And the, I think you know, that has to be done somehow. Could, may I interpolate something for the benefit of people who may not know, which is the criminal procedure rules in 2005, created under the aegis of Lord Wolfe, who was very concerned about expert evidence, actually contains a provision enabling a judge in the pretrial phase now, where there are conflicting experts, to order them to get together and produce a statement of what they agree on and what they don't, which is perhaps a little step in that direction. But well, you can do that on the criminal procedure rules. Yes. What Wolf also, I say, I'm not a great civil expert, said no. you will have one expert who will do the report and will do it on that. Now, you can't do that in crime. No. That's right. The most you can do is if you have two defence experts for two defendants, you can sometimes... Yeah. Yes. Now, plenty of other questions. The gentleman there in the blue shirt. Uh, I'm afraid I'm also a paediatrician. Um, <laughs> And I'm not going to defend the disagreements that occur. Um, but I'm, I'm interested as well in this idea of uh, informally getting together and agreeing the extent of disagreements and then formulating a consensus. Isn't there a danger that the jury are not going to be presented with and, and able to hear the cross-examination of that expert evidence? You may well have bias introduced by dominant parties producing a report on behalf of perhaps a, a, more, you know, a more powerful group. And um, it, it, there are examples around the world of legal systems where this has worked and, and where maybe there are drawbacks with that as well. Well, that's an extremely good question, if I may say so. I mean, <coughs> there have been examples, yes, where um, 
if expert, has to, expert evidence has to be given in certain fields, um, it is given by an independent expert. In other words, um, you don't get an expert produced by one party, and then of course the other one has to produce their expert, and then you get the punch and duty show um, uh, <coughs> that follows. Um, but it sounds like a great solution, the idea that the, you have this um, someone, someone from Mount Olympus to, um, to give an impartial view. But um, first of all, of course, it um, undermines the idea that um, there is very intensive cross-examination of that person because they're not meant to be a hostile witness, using that term very loosely. Um, they're meant to be this, this independent person. So why, what, what's the incentive to cross-examine them in a hostile way? You must have agreed to their being appointed in the first place. Um, so one gets into a slight problem there. Um, I think the, the other difficulty is the more familiar one, which is that in some, and indeed this is by no means um, a small scale problem, in some cases there will only be a relatively narrow range or number of experts who can perform that role. And if and so far as they become associated with particular views and theories, and that would hardly be surprising, the whole trial may end up revolving around which one of them gets picked, if you like, um, and that may skew uh, very much the course of the trial, and that I think will be extremely undesirable. Certainly, um, when we were discussing this at a preliminary stage, there was a very hostile um, reception amongst lawyers to the idea that um, you would not be able to cross-examine um, a witness, in, uh, an expert witness, exactly the way you can do now. And part of what makes that legitimate is that the, the other person's witness, that you're not just leading evidence in chief, you are actually cross-examining them in spite of So, the, I, I mean, I think we would really have trouble making that stick. Now, what's different, I think, is the idea that, um, the gentleman was saying, is the idea that actually the, 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 the expert witnesses that you yourself have called on both sides are able to get together and say, well, look, over this bit, actually, we're not disagreeing. So, um, you shouldn't start we don't want you probing for error over there, because actually we're, we're agreed on that point, and, and the advocates, one would hope, would, would buy into that. That's the point of the Wolf reform that um, Professor Benjamin mentioned. Um, and so the areas where the battle, battle will be joined, as it were, are, are known beforehand. Um, but that still doesn't, in the end, I think, completely get you over the problem to which you alluded, and which was the first thing, that when we, we went to, the old Bailey judges very kindly agreed if we want them to, at the Law Commission, that we will meet to discuss any given project that we've got with them all, and they're extremely helpful. And the very first person, when I set out our official proposals on this, said, OK, well, solve this then. I'm doing a problem in which you've got three eminent experts on one side, three eminent experts on the other side, baby shaking the case. I, what am I going to say to the jury? I mean, well, well, they, they've got to... Because somehow they've got to be convinced that the, the one side, that the defence experts, is just the evidence is, is absolutely comes to nothing, virtually. Um, and then everybody comes to that conclusion. So how do I solve that? To which, of course, I don't really have an answer. Because, um, as I say, what we're looking at is not quite that problem. But that is, I mean, I'm not, that's not in any way to undermine the significance of the problem. Most uh, people, um, just about this. Um, just, just contrasting with the criminal side. Uh, on the civil side, we, we have not We've almost rejected the single joint expert in any serious case, mm. and in particular fairly shaking cases. I think that it's almost a fundamental principle of natural justice that if the area has any controversy, there should be at least a second opinion. Well, yes. But we do um, case manage in a much more open and strong way. Um, every expert, before being consulted, has to be approved by the court after the case management appeal. The, the process of knocking their heads together has to be open and, to use that awful political word, transparent. That's to say when they meet, everything they say to each other should be logged and limited. So that the process is... Because, uh, forgive me for saying so, but there, there is a certain medical school version of bullying that's to say that they all get in a room and they all get one up in the corner by his tie and say, you are right aligned with us, mate. And that person is pushed into uh, changing their view. So it needs to be apparent that somebody's changed their view and why. 
But I, I, I really don't think that it's necessarily a just process to lean towards means and experts for the defence. An expert that the court permits to give evidence for defence should be just as better funded, just as well. Oh, yes. Well, and, and there is in the criminal ones the business of getting the um, dodgy experts out of the cupboard and then being given within the trial setting exactly the same sort of deference as the uh, mainstream does. Yeah, no, I, I agree. We, we were very clear, although it did cause some <coughs> controversy, we were very clear here that what we were saying would apply equally to the defence as it applies to the prosecution. But obviously the, that is to do with the, the reliability or the expert status of the expert. Um, but clearly, as I was saying, all their evidence has to do, their evidence doesn't have to do as much, if I can put it in that way, in order to fulfill its purpose, not like the prosecution evidence. Um, and so there, are, there is that slight difference. We're having a lively discussion, but people are beginning to start to have to go, and there are indeed drinks out in the reception area. Shall we have one more question, and then wind up for drinks, over which I hope Jeremy is prepared to continue to answer questions when he's actually got by the tie in the corner, as I described a minute ago. One further.